I'm going to open the meeting, but before I do, I just wanted to read this announcement. In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Again, I apologize for the late start. We had some uh, urgent business we had to attend to that ran a little late, so I appreciate the understanding and flexibility. We're going to move things around a little bit on the agenda before I get to the public comment. We're going to go to the municipal opiate litigation portion of the agenda, and I'm going to turn that over to the town administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, those who have been uh, paying attention to the local media may have seen that there are a number of cities and towns in the state that have been considering uh, legal action relative to the opioid epidemic, um, which has really hit the nation, but um, included in that is the state as well here in Massachusetts. And we've been approached by uh, our town council, Copeland and Page, as well as attorney Richard Sandman, who is here this evening, relative to an action that would be an opportunity for the town to consider um, pursuing a legal action against the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, as I think those who have been watching our budget presentations, the actions of the community impact team, and the discussions here in the board, and this has been an issue that has had our attention for a number of years now that we've been focused on. And I put some information in the uh, packet um, that uh, I can refer to later on uh, relative to the impact here in North Reading in terms of the actual cases and then the untold impact of the opioid epidemic uh, across uh, families and acquaintance of those who uh, uh, suffer with addiction or ultimately are victims uh, of their addiction. Um, so with that, uh, we have attorney Richard Sandman and attorney uh, Mark Risch here from um, Coleman and Page uh, to speak to this legal action and we'll ask the board to take a, uh, a vote to uh, authorize these attorneys to file suit on behalf of the town uh, on this action. So through you, Mr. Chairman, I would turn it over to attorney Rich, attorney Sandman. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just very briefly, I know you have a very busy schedule. Mark Rich from KP Law Town Council and Rich Sandman from uh, Salmon, uh, Rodman, Rodman. Rodman, Rodman, and Salmon. I, I apologize. Um, we, I appreciate the opportunity to be before you once again. I know we, pre we presented quite extensively in executive session, you know, litigation and our involvement in this litigation um, as town council becoming involved with uh, with the, the national coalition to uh, uh, pursue this litigation. I think, uh, in the interest of brevity, I'll turn it over to Attorney Salmon so that he could explain exactly what this litigation is about. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the uh, of the board. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, and um, we look forward to working with North Reading together with the other 60 or 70 communities that have signed up with us to pursue cases against the manufacturers and the distributors of very dangerous opioid products. These companies, we believe and we contend, have been flooding the markets with, in violation of federal law with opioids. And um, the effect has been devastating to many communities. I believe that every community in Massachusetts has been affected in one way or the other, and that you, everyone in this room, is likely to know someone who's been affected either with an overdose that resulted in death or an overdose that resulted in some kind of treatment. It's a national epidemic. It's a significant epidemic here in Massachusetts, and we're doing something about it. We're one, Mark's firm and my firm are two of nine firms that are part of a consolidated group called MOLA, Massachusetts Opioid Litigation Attorneys. And we are pursuing cases to recover on behalf of North Reading da past damages and future damages. The past damages will be you have paid money for extra police, for overtime, for fire. You have paid money for other, perhaps other um, EMS services. You have perhaps paid money for Narcan, for treatment, for education and that money we're seeking to recoup. And on a going forward basis, that might be more important. The, the epidemic isn't going anywhere, and you will need money to fight, and the same areas that I've just mentioned will be um, in need of funds. So we will be seeking funds for police, for overtime, educational programs, treatment, 
Narcan again, and um, anything else that will help us fight this very devastating crisis. I'm available to answer any questions um, that you have, and we've obviously spoken and sent some materials to, uh, to the town in the past and prepared to answer anything should you have any additional questions. Mr. Goldberg. So uh, just a little bit of information about the impact here in North Reading, and this is information provided to me by the police chief. Uh, in 2014, we responded to 15 overdoses, four of which were fatal. Uh, one of the overdoses included, in, involved a nine-month pregnant female and her unborn child. 2015, we responded to 24 overdoses with two being fatal. 2016, 20 opiate overdoses that we responded to with one being fatal. And 2017, last year, responded to 19 opiate overdoses with four being fatal. So those are statistics, obviously speaking to the impact, but what is not told in that is the impact upon families, uh, the impact upon um, our, uh, those who live here in town. Um, and I, I think, you know, I don't want to speak for the board, but I think our hope is that uh, anything we might be able to recover would allow us to address this issue in the future, address other issues of substance abuse in the issue, whether it be in the form of treatment, prevention, additional services to respond or otherwise. And it, I think it's important too. Any additional um, way we can go ahead and publicize this issue, and continue to be part of that movement across this country, will start to wake up and actually have some progress in this area. So I am proud and look forward to voting for this action this evening. And I thank you for doing this and taking this on. So if there's any other questions from the board, we'll take a motion. Uh, just if we could just so the public at home can hear um, what will be the cost to the town to pursue this litigation there won't be cost to the town we will front all out-of-pocket costs uh, will be paid on a contingency fee basis if we're successful we get paid if we're successful those costs will be reimbursed on a pro rata basis we hope there's going to be a national resolution that could be quite significant in size and uh, we will be d determining the damages that you've sustained and what kind of funds you're going to need going forward so you, um, and as far as any costs that are concerned, pro rata, we'll recover them if we're successful. If we're not successful, we don't get paid anything, including costs. Mr. Masseri. I think uh, you should probably add the fact that the drugs have led to a lot of crime, and that crime is costing the town money too. It's costing all the towns and the Commonwealth money. It's, and um, in many cases, some people have been hurt or even killed. And it crosses borders, too. People from other borders, other towns, or North Reading goes into, some people may go into another town to, to get the products. It does affect, um, it does affect um, uh, your crime rate. It affects perceptions of cities and towns across the country. Unfortunately, those numbers, any number, Mr. Gilberto just laid out, any of those are significant. The number one would be significant. Some of the communities have been very much um, very largely um, impacted. Sounds like North Reading has done, a, relatively speaking, a very good job uh, with regard to controlling the crisis. Nevertheless, um, we're going to recover what we can for you for past and future damages. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, I, I just think it's a, uh, a marvelous opportunity for us, and I appreciate the opportunity being presented to us, you know, from Attorney Sam Ebb, but also KP Law, uh, whereby, you know, there isn't going to be any expenditures or outlay by the community in order to uh, have a significant, I believe, going to have a significant impact when you have so many communities participating in this and hopefully nationwide uh, participating in it to get some uh, so, some results. So, I, I, again, I appreciate the opportunity to participate. I think it's something that uh, we're looking forward to, and uh, <coughs> we wish much success, and uh, not just from a financial standpoint, but from a, uh, um, a standpoint of quality of life and how everybody's uh, dealing with this uh, this epidemic so we appreciate you, you coming forward and offering it the opportunity to us and I look forward to uh, participating I just just to echo a little bit of what everyone's saying too I don't want, want to be duplicative but as attorney CMM was mentioning I mean this is something that affects everyone if it hasn't it will unfortunately substance abuse is a demon that people deal with for their entire lives and it takes a massive amount of effort and resources to help people who are addicted and to help the families. And I think it's affecting us all in terms of the, the utilization of the depletion of municipal resources towards this. And we had, uh, our DA came here to speak at the Senior Center about 
how this epidemic actually originated and to know that, like you said, that the pharmaceuticals are flooding the market. You go into the emergency room with a torn rotator cuff, come out with 150 Oxycontin and you're left to police, you manage that and, and you're left to police that in terms of this highly addictive narcotic medication which would really or should really be a last resort to be prescribed but is a first resort and has been a first resort and it's just growing and growing and growing. So I think that any effort that can be made, and I applaud you too for this, but any effort that we can take to address this and if, if we can either recuperate or replenish the resources that we've directed towards this, I think it's a worthy endeavor for us to, and I'm, I'm in favor of it as well. Thank you. Now, just one last thing I want to thank you, Mrs. Minupelli, for bringing this forward and, and bringing these, for, these gentlemen forward and this idea forward for our consideration. And without, your, without you doing that, we wouldn't be having this discussion tonight, so I want to thank you. So with that being said, I'll take the motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to retain the firm of Levin, uh, Papantonio, Thomas, Mitchell, Rafferty, and Proctor, PA, to pursue a civil suit against those legally responsible for the wrongful distribution of prescription opiates and damages caused thereby to authorize the clerk of the board to sign the engagement to represent and further to authorize the filing of such suit. Second. I got a motion and a second by Ms. Minupelli. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay. We're going to move to our public comment. Anybody here for public <laughs> comment? Mr. Schultz, did you want to? A quick public service announcement, if I may, Mr. Chair. Go right ahead. Um, it has come to my attention there's been an issue at the Ipswich River Park lately with off-leash dogs and people not picking up after their dogs if their dogs use the facilities. Um, just want to let the town know that uh, it, uh, a citation today was issued for an off-leash dog and we are going to start they are going to start enforcing this. It's the vast vast majority of people follow all the rules at the park and are great dog owners but there's a, there's a handful out there that just don't feel the rules apply to them and it's really unfair for the people who do follow the rules it is not fair for our Parks and Recs Department to have to pick up waste, you know, animal feces. There's a public safety issue. Also, if dogs are off leash, many little kids are in the park. Kids are often afraid. I know you may feel your dog is friendly, but a little kid, it may be frightening to them. We just ask that, you know, people please follow the rules. Please keep your dog on leash. Please pick up after your dogs. We have plenty of bags for picking up dog waste right where you enter the park. There's signs all over the place. and. Uh, you know, we, we don't want this to become an issue, but it is going to be enforced now. So I just want to make sure the public is aware of that. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Uh, proclamation, Michael, do you want to do the proclamation now? Yeah. Okay. And is there anybody here from the North Reading Dollars for Scholars? Mrs. Akivati. Mrs. Akivati. If you wouldn't mind, make, mind making your way over to the podium would be fantastic. <laughs> I'll turn it over to you. Please. Hi, I'm Kathy Achivati. I'm the chair, president of Dollars for Scholars. Every year we do a phone-a-thon, March 4th to March 8th, and it's when we make the um, calls from either the high school or Century 21, and we're asking for donations for the scholarships for the high school students and also our postgraduates, residents of all New North Reading. Um, last year we gave away $29,000 and we had 49 scholarships. 18 were, of them were postgrad and the 32 were for the high school kids. And we're expecting a very big class this year. So we ask that you claim next week Dollars for Scholars Week. Thank you. Anybody want any questions? But I, I appreciate the time you give. Uh, yeah, I know you don't get paid to do what you do, but no, it, it helps but a I lot of children it. in this town. Even many of the members sitting yeah. up here at this seat, in these seats, that the children future too will hopefully get the benefit of this program. And, and so I welcome anyone that would like to volunteer. I'm always looking for young people to help. And I have a lot of the kids that have received scholarships come back and do help. So if they so want to volunteer, who do they contact? Do you have? They uh, can contact me. Okay. Is there or anyone on the board? Do you have Put a your name and phone number up on the big screen? Is there, no, is there, <laughs> like no, there's a website. Isn't there a website? Do you guys yes, have there a, is. There is a website. So if they, what's the website so people at home listening or they can get it in the paper? It's you don't know. Um, not writing dollars for scholars. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, and again, 
Yes. Um, we're going to do again, the Mr. Chairman, just, you know, yes. again, uh, <coughs> my two boys were uh, beneficiaries yeah. of it and uh, it certainly assisted them in uh, covering some of the costs associated with, you know, books and tuition and all the rest. And uh, as a parent, uh, certainly appreciated it too because uh, the cost of education hasn't no. gone down. No. It is unbelievable. Where's so, it end? Uh, you know, the, the work that the, uh, the board members and the kids who are volunteering do uh, really has paid dividends for how many years now? 55. 55 years here in the community and then to be congratulated and uh, appreciated and uh, again we urge everybody to uh, answer the phone when Great. they call. So we'll um, take the proclamation, we'll vote on it and then we'll take a picture if you don't get Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to proclaim the week of March 4th through March 8th to be North Reading Dollar for Scholar Week and to read the proclamation. Second. I got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Please read the proclamation. Okay, we have a proclamation from the Board of Selectmen. Whereas North Reading Dollars for Scholars is a group of hardworking, dedicated individuals, and whereas North Reading Dollars for Scholars have devoted both time and talent to the difficult task of seeking scholarship funds for deserving students, and whereas North Reading Dollar for Scholars is planning its annual phonathon for the week of March 4th through the 8th, 2018, where high school students will contact all North Reading residents. Uh, by telephone seeking pledges to the North Reading Dollars for Scholars Scholarship Fund. Now therefore we, the Board of Selectmen of North Reading, do hereby <coughs> proclaim the week of March 4th through Mar March 8th, 2018 as North Reading Dollars for Scholars Week and urge all citizens to open their hearts and purses for the benefit of North Reading students who want to continue their education. And this would be signed by Michael A. Prisco, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. the pleasure this evening to get a quick update on all the happenings over at 104 Lowell Road since we did the transaction with Pulte Homes. We have this evening we have Reed Blut with us from Pulte Homes to give us a quick presentation and kind of get us up to speed on the going, uh, goings on over there. Thank you very Reed, much. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much Mr. Chairman. Um, hey Michael? Yes. Uh, quick technological question. Here. Can we, can we get back and put it on the slideshow? It, it is called Martin's Lane. Oh, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. There was a PowerPoint presentation, if you'd like that one. So that? Who's the actual guy named Mark? Yeah. 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 I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Who was Martin's pawn named that? Like, who's Mr. Martin? Martin. 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 Good question. Do you know? Last name. I don't know. It's true. It could be you know <laughs> all that stuff. Yeah. 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 Try, try that one. We'll find out. Oh, okay. sorry. <laughs> sorry. I guess. You want to give a card to him? Oh, there we go. Martin's report. Good Yeah. Must be somebody came down. Slideshow for yeah. you in the beginning. From the beginning, yeah. I could. There we go. Yeah. Great. No. Sorry. Uh, sorry about that. No problem. Um, we apologize. So, just um, to reiterate, my name is Reed Blut, and I work with uh, Pulte Homes, and um, we're, you know, fortunate enough to be starting off um, with our Martin's Landing community, which is at the location of previously the um, J T Berry Center off Lowell Road. Uh, near the Edgewood Apartments, which I know everyone's familiar with. And we've been working with the town for quite some time. 
uh, members of the board, um, Mr. Gilberto and, and other staff. And um, last year, you know, we were all fortunate enough at the end of the year to be able to conclude the, the closing on the property. And uh, then we've, um, you know, and prior to that during the year, we worked with um, the permitting departments uh, throughout the town, and they're very cooperative and uh, responsive. And we were able to get moving under the under that deadline. So uh, we are very um, pleased about that, and, and proud to be able to start here in North Reading. And um, I was asked tonight to give a, a brief update on the status of our uh, of our construction there, and. Um, I'll, I'll do that. I'll run through, run through things quickly. Feel free to um, to interject if you have a question. Just and a quick then, question to start. Yes. How did you come up with the name Martin's Landing? Well, I mean, it was um, um, a nod to Martin's Brook, which is in the rear of the property. And I know there's also a Martin's Pond in the other end of town. But, um, but we really um, keyed on to that. And then the landing component is sort of, uh, again, uh, you know, a nod to the proximity of the brook for, you know, kayaking, canoeing, things like that. It's, it's uh, mostly a marketing name, but we wanted something that was local and something that, um, you know, we felt was appropriate. Thank you. Um, here's just um, some uh, um, a Google map of the uh, existing conditions from last year, since Google map, that's about when it is, a year or so behind. and. Uh, we can see that the um, Edgewood apartments are off to the left, and then the treat area, which um, was pre is, is the 34-acre uh, parcel that we purchased from the town, is pretty much in the middle. So, oh, here's our, oh, that's different. Um, this isn't the way that has changed on your computer for some reason. Let me see if I can get Back to, okay. Um, yeah, sorry about this. I That's think okay. I miss, I'm just missing a couple of slides, but I'll I'll just jump to the construction, the status of construction. So right now, if you look at this aerial um, picture, at the top in the center is the um, existing Edgewood Apartments, and their main road is sort of curves toward the the uh, camera in this photograph, and off to the left. The um, entryway, um, soon to be named Berryway, uh, is uh, connects out to Route uh, 62, a low road on the left. So, our plan is for this three-way intersection to become a four-way intersection, and the uh, fourth road will be the new road to be constructed into Martin's Landing, and it's under construction right now. And the small building, which um, is a, a sales trailer right now, a be a temporary sales trailer that you can see um, in the uh, sort of the center left of this picture. And you can see the um, there's a little bit of snow on the ground back last Friday, I think it was, on the north sides. Um, and you can see the construction has uh, commenced. This is the first building that's under construction right now, uh, building one for, for lack of another number. And in the, the back of uh, the foundation, you can see the existing pine trees. Those are going to remain. Uh, we want to keep as many of those tall pines as was possible. Um, also, at the, so the top, you can see um, low road running uh, left to right. Here, we're, we're just looking a little bit to the west. Uh, the emergency access and the construction access is uh, shown sort of to the center right with a couple of um, entry uh, temporary construction trailer, office trailers are located there. And the foundation for our second building is off to the upper left. I don't know, can you see that? Oh, it does work, okay. So this little um, uh, area here will be the second building. I'll zip through these relatively quickly. <coughs> Again, looking to the southwest, really I'm just showing the change of status of the property since uh, December when we, um, when we transferred title. So we've been working there very diligently. Um, what we're doing in general here that you see is we're preparing the ground, we're doing what we call cuts and fills, mass grading. Uh, we're preparing for the installation of the utilities. So we have water throughout the property, town water. And then we have a wastewater treatment plant which is handled on, on the property, a private wastewater treatment plant which is located back in this area. 
if you can see the little cursor, sort of to the center on the left, um, they're working on the, the commenced construction of, of that facility, which will have to be up and running by the time we have occupancies in the first building. Again, just a, another um, little pan over to the, uh, to the east, to the southeast, and a general um, view of the property. And approximately the center will be the uh, future leaching field that's associated with the wastewater treatment facility, even though the facility is in uh, sort of towards the back uh, on this photograph, the leaching uh, area is, is up towards the front, which will ultimately be used as a, as a village green, since all of that will be buried underground. This is the location of the uh, existing temporary sales trailer, uh, which once the first building is completed and occupied, this trailer will be removed and the clubhouse will be built here. So as you're coming in, um, soon to be Berry Way, you would turn right at the uh, three-way, soon to be four-way intersection and then directly into the parking area and uh, stop and visit at the um, temporary sales office trailer. And again, then again, it's uh, moving backwards a little uh, with our backs to um, Route 62 and there's a, a stand of pine trees that we were able to keep um, to help buffer our community from, uh, from the street, frankly. Um, this is just a, uh, a photograph of a similar type of home that we're envisioning uh, constructing. We have on our plan uh, nine buildings similar to this, 450 homes altogether in nine buildings. There's 50 units in each building. Um, it, it is uh, limited to uh, age 55 and better, so age restricted. Uh, I have a, a number of interior photographs here from similar um, homes just to give you all an idea and folks at home an idea of uh, what the homes will actually look like once they're completed uh, and once they're furnished. We have uh, two different, mainly different styles of buildings. By that I mean uh, one bedroom homes and two bedroom homes. This particular one's a corner unit, it's a two bedroom home. Uh, this shows uh, design a kitchen which is very similar to, the, to all of the kitchens in the various homes, which are an important focal point of the family. Uh, there are uh, options that are available, uh, countertops, uh, different type of um, um, stoves, refrigerators, things like that. Again, I say this is a two bedroom unit, so um, um, there's just an idea of what the two bedrooms could look like. There's a formal living room and a formal dining room in this particular style. Um, again, this is a decorated model. This is a uh, an idea of what it could look like in one of the one bedroom homes. Uh, it's more of an open concept. The kitchen is the photo in the top left. If you turn to the right a bit from the kitchen, you can see your dining area, your living room, right out to the uh, sliding glass doors and the balcony. Every home has its own balcony, uh, which is kind of nice outside. You can step out, get some fresh air, um, have a um, uh, stable and chairs outside. Uh, this is um, <coughs> An example of one of the um, home offices which is available in um, some of the styles uh, in the upper left for folks who are you know, still working from home which is quite quite popular actually. Uh, here's our um, uh, proposed future foyer. Uh, there's uh, secure access. Um, the main foyer uh, does have an open area which contains the mail room so to speak but once you get past the mail room to uh, the doors in the end of this photograph, uh, those are secure and only open to residents who would have a fob or code so they could get in. And if you have a visitor, there's a communications um, a terminal in the open foyer where you can buzz, um, buzz whoever you're visiting and they can uh, buzz you in. Also, the elevators are located here. So you can, on the upper left photo, the elevator goes up all four floors and then it goes down to the basement in the parking garage. And here's a couple of photos of a parking garage, um, safe, secure, again it has um, controlled access <coughs> where you have to have um, a code or a fob to get in and a nice thing, no more shoveling snow or scraping of ice if you're in the parking garage. This is a, a, a photo of um, we're calling the Landings Club, that's our proposed clubhouse which will be, um, which will replace the uh, sales trailer once we're up and running in the first building. The 
Uh, Clubhouse is really a focal point for the community activities. And we're envisioning things like there'll be a fitness center, a cards room in there, arts and crafts area, a meeting room, etc. So that uh, everyone can, uh, they can gather there, they can um, use that as a kicking off point for <coughs> using the walking trails, biking, and all sorts of activities. Our um, target homeowner, as I mentioned, uh, is um, 55 and better because that is the age restriction to live at um, Martin's Landing. And what we found is that folks of, of that interest level, they're very, um, they're very active, they want to be outside, uh, they're often still working or uh, consulting or perhaps uh, semi-retired, so they have more flexibility, more free time, and they can enjoy their, their pursuits, uh, they can um, avail themselves of kayaking um, uh, in, uh, in Martins Brook area and other uh, nearby areas, and uh, also avail themselves of just walking around the property. So. Our Village Green has a rendering uh, similar to what we envision it to be like. Uh, it will be a, a large open green, as I mentioned um, earlier. There's a, a gazebo, a trail system, so folks can walk around and enjoy the, enjoy the outdoors. Um, just about the end now, um, positive fiscal impact to the town. Uh, we all, you know, we've heard this before, but I think it's worth repeating. Uh, property that previously paid no property taxes at all to the town, you know, is now upon completion going to generate between two and a half and three million dollars on a, a, stain, a sustainable annual basis in property taxes. And most of those funds, approximately 93 percent, are uh, net to the town. In other words, about seven percent of that number, by our calculations, would be used to offset um, services, and there will be some services. Naturally, there's fire, there's police, there's ambulance. However, uh, we're not expecting any significant addition to kids in school, uh, and um, the, being a condominium community, all of the other services, plowing, snow plowing, um, uh, trash uh, removal, uh, maintenance and repair of the roadways, things like that are covered by the community, so it's not a cost to the town. Um, just to wrap up, this is our prospective time schedule. Um, we're, clearly we're underway now and I showed you the uh, where we are in construction of the first building. Our hope is that by the end of this year we should have folks moving into our first building. Um, as long as you know as we're, we're able to get our, um, our vertical building permit in a timely fashion, which I, I'm sure we'll be able to do, uh, we'll be working on our first building. Then uh, we have two more buildings scheduled to come on rapidly uh, after that. Um, they're numbered in sequence here, but those sequences, we jump around a little bit in building number uh, from, the, uh, from the site plan. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're, built, we're doing building one first, we're doing building uh, five second, we're doing building four third, building six, fourth, et cetera. We're working our way around the, around the loop. Um, Again, in general, right now, we're hoping to do one, or one to two buildings uh, each year. It's largely going to be driven by uh, market acceptance <coughs> and demand. But the work that we have done thus far in uh, researching the demographics and the market demand have been very strong here in North Reading. And our, really, our target buyer is someone who lives in town now. Uh, they've, uh, um, they've raised their kids. The, the kids are, are, are out, they're either at school or they moved away, and now they have the empty nest syndrome, which you know, we've all heard about, and they're ready to downsize. So they have a desire to stay in their community. They've been here for many years. They have friends, they have social uh, connections, they have church connections, they volunteer in the community. They don't want to leave the community, but they want to leave the headaches of the big house. So this gives them an opportunity, which we feel is a, is a great benefit to, uh, to residents in town now and it allows them an area where they can stay in town, they can you know, enjoy um, their um, the 55 plus years, their empty nester years, they can still be active, they can still be working as they have in the past and involved in uh, community activities, they don't have to leave town and they get a new home which is, um, which is very desirable to a lot of folks. Um, 
They don't have to shovel snow. They don't have to mow the lawn. They don't have to clean the gutters, do any outside painting. <coughs> it's all taken care of by the condominium association. So I know I threw a lot of information out here very rapidly, but I want to be respectful of your time. And if there's any questions, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Mr. O'Leary, please. Uh, so welcome to the community, first of all. Thank you. And, uh, just for the public's information, uh, what do you anticipate the cost of the units to be? So, yes, yeah, so that's a, that's a fair question. I get it a lot, frankly. Right. Um, and, you know, frankly, we haven't set the pricing yet. And um, the, the most honest answer I can give everyone is uh, the prices will be set at the time that they're offered for sale comparable to what the market prices are. Now, what, what I've interpreted that to mean is we're probably going to see pricing in the low threes to the high threes right now. That's about where the market is for, for our type of home. There, the one bedroom homes clearly will be, are smaller. They are approximately 1,000 square feet, the two bedroom homes. Uh, on the corner, it's the largest one, that's approximately 1,500 square feet, some of the photos I showed you. Uh, those, those homes are more expensive, they're larger. Um, as one moves up the, um, the building in floor, there's a premium for the penthouse homes. They're a little more expensive than the ones on the first floor or the second floor. So right now, um, we actually have seven different styles uh, of two bedrooms and one bedrooms. And each one's a, a little different in square footage, but uh, generally that's what we're expecting from the low trees up to the high threes and maybe a penthouse if someone puts in all the options it could touch four hundred thousand. Um, that's a that's but, a guess but no, that's don't that's hold important to, to know and I, it actually I seems it relatively on. speaking fairly reasonable and something that people locally would consider and that uh, Jane's yes. already thinking about it. We have not we have not done the company in budget yet but um, you know again typically we we try to keep the condo fee around 300-ish. Um, and it varies, again, each, each home, is, the fee is set by their square footage. There's a formula to do that. But um, we've intentionally not um, loaded the community, the residents, with expensive amenities. So things like swimming pools, tennis courts, uh, we do have a nice clubhouse, but it's a, um, it's a very economical one to run. So uh, we feel that we'd rather than have a lot of amenities built as part of the condominium, which everyone would have to pay for every month whether they used it or not. Not everyone goes swimming, not everyone plays tennis. And if you're not using those, you still have to pay for it if it's part of the um, condominium. So what we've tried to do is keep those costs down so they'll be in the 300 range for everyone, and then um, folks who are uh, tennis players or uh, you know, swimming or uh, want to play baseball, softball, uh, any of those types of activities, we want them to use the uh, amenities that are already in uh, the local area. So amenities that are here just next door, the other side of the apartments, you know, there's a public park where you know, folks can go instead of building another one on the site. Uh, swimming pools in the area and uh, tennis courts in the area, that's what we really envision our, our folks to, to be able to utilize rather than having to pay for them on site. It's also important to note that this isn't your first project. Not our first no, project. Well, oh. Fulte's been around a little while and you have lots of experience with it. And, we do. Uh, and I think that was uh, one of the benefits of yep. your proposal that weighed heavily uh, yes, we're connecting with you because you know this is not a first go around for you. No, we we built um, we built um, many of these types of homes and these types of communities. Over 55 communities for active adults. Um, 55 and better is um, probably right now it's the majority of our work. There's a there's a great um, um, number of folks who are. Uh, it, are hitting that age and continuing to, um, you know, to, to grow and mature in age, the baby boomer generation, and those folks are, are going to continue to grow and mature and 
to need what we feel is this type of housing you know, in the future for the next 10 plus years, the demographics just keep on rising. Um, the nice thing about that is that uh, we all know there's the millennial generation too that is also growing and maturing now and even though they seem to have waited, delayed to start their family life and, and move out of the parents' family home, it's starting to happen more and more now. So they're starting to form families, they're starting to purchase homes and they can now purchase uh, a, um, an existing home which perhaps an empty nester is decided, well, they don't need that much space anymore. They're ready to downsize. Now the millennial family buyer is ready to move into that first family home. So it's a great synergy and it, it actually provides um, housing for two different types of, of um, you know, buyer demand. Any other questions? Well, thank you. I, I hope you're finding everything you need from the town. We're able to provide you the permitting in a timely manner and all the information being exchanged, hopefully to your liking. And yeah, everything you know. has gone very well, as I, as I said in the beginning, and um, it's been a great um, uh, group to work with here, the staff and, and the, the folks in this room as well. And, you know, we look forward to, right now, we're working mostly with, uh, uh, you know, engineering, building department, you know, we're starting to get into the nitty gritty with, uh, with those folks, um, but, you know, we've had pre-meetings with them, it's been a lot of open communication, and that's really the key. Um, nobody likes any surprises. You know, we don't want to surprise anybody. And uh, similarly, um, you know, it's just it's all about communication. That's been very, uh, very good and very open. So I'm sure that will continue. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't. Be. And uh, thank you again for agreeing to uh, meet on the 14th with all of us when uh, Secretary Ash comes into town and provide the same presentation. I know he's looking forward to it. He, you and Yes, happy to, and please um, let me know any any uh, tweaks I should make. We will. We will. <laughs> any other board members like to thank you, and again, welcome to the neighborhood. And You're welcome. We we love seeing the progress. So thank you. Okay. Thanks thank a lot. You. Have a good Appreciate evening. It. All right. Next, approve legal bills. Mr. Schultz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to authorize payment of $120,000 retainer for legal services, deposition costs, and expert services for Furman Gregory Deptula, and further to release the amount of $71,867.01 from a previous retainer payment to pay invoice uh, number 11,360, dated February 9, 2018. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Not heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Minutes? Minutes for February 12, 2018, regular session, please. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the February 12, 2018, regular session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. All right. To the fun portion of this evening. Oops. Executive session. Oh, we do. That's right. Go ahead. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the February 12, 2018 executive session minutes as written. Second. Motion. We got a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? <coughs> None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Now we get to it. The fiscal year 2019 budget status. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Gilberto. And Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rourke. As the uh, finance director approaches the podium, um, as we did last year, we've put together a PowerPoint presentation which is uh, effectively intends to convey a, a little more, um, or maybe in larger print, <laughs> the information that's on the revenue and expense plan which was in the meeting packet for this evening. I'll just note that I provided the, the, the last updated copy to the board at the February 12th meeting. I indicated at that time that there was a financial planning team meeting scheduled for that week. That meeting was held and a revised plan was reviewed and the plan, the copy that's in your packet this evening reflects that revised plan. Uh, we have uh, some slides that we'll go through that I'll ask the finance director to reference which will largely reflect what is in that revenue and expense plan. Um, this really wasn't intended to be a discussion about the um, 
hundreds of pages of departmental budget requests that have been received, which we will evaluate over the coming meetings. Uh, it's more intended to provide the bigger picture of where things stand. And I will um, just note for everyone to understand who may not have, for anyone who has not seen or participated in the budget process in the past, who may be watching, um, this is really the first uh, public discussion of some details of the budget. Um, it coincides with uh, what I believe has been the release of the school um, committee's uh, budget for fiscal year 2019 as well. This is the beginning of the public portion of the process, which will go on through um, likely the end of April, the first week of May, and perhaps even beyond, um, where uh, the requests will be reviewed and prioritized through the budget hearings and ultimately uh, reconciliation to a balanced budget will occur uh, towards the end of April, as has been the case in previous years. The one thing that I, I will note, um, which I'm sure you've seen in the, in the information that's in the packet, that is different this year is that we did ask departments to request, um, we did provide the opportunity to allow departments to, to request beyond uh, level services requests, which uh, some departments did. Um, we obviously, we're not in a position to be able to recommend all of those items. Um, some of the items that were recommended um, in my recommendation to the, to the board uh, may or may not survive the budget process, but that will be something that we'll factor in uh, after we have the departmental budget hearings. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Elizabeth Rourke, Finance Director, to go through the presentation. Please. Good evening. So as um, Michael just mentioned, I'm just going to give a brief overview of the FY19 um, budget forecast. Um, it's basically taking the revenue plan, which you've all seen, and um, just laying it out um, in different sections so that it's uh, uh, clearer to read and more um, larger. Okay, so um, this slide we have every year. It uh, explains our key revenue sources um, as part of our revenue plan. One of the major new pieces to our revenue for FY19, as we just heard, um, is the addition of Polte Homes, which was a piece of uh, town-owned land that now is going to be brought onto the tax rolls. Um, a very small piece is recognized for FY19, and as the build-out continues um, each year, there will be additional new growth and tax revenue from, from that property. Um, and then annually we have local aid that consists of Chapter 70, um, which is school aid, and we have unrestricted local aid. Both of those items, according to the governor's budget, have uh, increased slightly for FY19, and we'll see those increases in a future slide. We also then account for local receipts, which is uh, made up of motor vehicle excise tax, license and permits, fines and forfeitures, fees, um, investment income, there's a whole slew of local receipts that um, are accounted for. And then under other sources, other sources is other financing sources, so it would be a transfer in from ambulance um, receipts reserve or in from uh, water and direct costs or a transfer in from the debt capital stabilization fund to offset uh, the debt service budget. So those are some of those uh, other sources. This is a, a quick snapshot of the revenue plan, just broken down into the major categories that we just um, viewed on the previous slide. So it's just comparing our current fiscal year of FY18 to FY19. Um, we also then list the dollar amount change and the percent change. Um, so as I mentioned, new growth, we are factoring in um, a small dollar amount for just the land value of um, Martin's Landing because that was what was recorded uh, prior to uh, January 1st. Last year, new growth came in higher for some new developments um, and you know remodels within town. So this is a, you know a conservative estimate. Um, like I said, slightly Chapter 70 and unrestricted increase and motor vehicle excise um, and um, was our biggest increase under local receipts at, at this point. Okay, moving on. Budget elements. So um, the composition of the annual operating budget is 
made up of fixed costs, which are employees' benefits, health insurance, workers' comp, um, unemployment, um, you know, those, those are some of the major ones, uh, also Medicare. Then um, another component of debt service would be, uh, another component of fiscal costs would be debt service and um, the regional school assessments, which would be um, Essex Technical and Northeast. Um, those are large components of our fixed costs. Then we get uh, the town's general government budget as well as the school's budget. But first, um, of available revenue, the fixed costs come off the top. And then the general government budget uh, receives 34% of the remaining available revenue, and the school re uh, receives 66% of the available revenue. The major driver of our um, fixed cost budget would be health insurance and debt service. Those would be the, the two. Um, but health insurance, you can see, is a, a, large, a large piece of it, um, and each year, it grows substantially. So currently our health insurance budget is 5.8 million um, and for FY19 we are factoring an, a 7.5 percent increase to health insurance. So that is what the 6.3 million represents, 6.289. Um, we also are, you know, in the process of um, reviewing the actual co uh, cost for claims and we are looking into the performance of our PFA, which was something that we implemented in um, FY18, as well as um, having discussions with the IAC, which is our employee um, union uh, group makeup of group uh, that we review at this time of year, almost monthly. We have pretty consistent meetings with the IAC. This year's um, key expenditure drivers, like I mentioned, health insurance, uh, county retirement is always a, a large one as well, um, general liability insurance, which is property and casualty, uh, Medicare, and the capital improvement um, plan. We each year incrementally increase that approximately $25,000 from raise and appropriate. And this year, um, our solid waste collection contract expires in June. And one of the town's um, biggest budget drivers would be the solid waste collection um, anticipated industry increase. Um, this number, you know, could be a lot larger. Uh, and this number comes from the town administrator's um, budget request. Um, the departmental's budget request was a lot larger. Mm -hmm. And we will review that on Saturday morning. Mr. Bissari. Liz, what? Uh, you may have said it and I missed it. The county retirement that you've got in the plan here is an increase of how much percentage? I, I believe it's um, three and a half percent. We'll see that in a future slide. Oh, okay. Yep. Same thing with the uh, health insurance. Health insurance, yes. Okay. Health insurance so is a seven and a half percent increase, but I do break this down on a future slide. Okay. Thank you. Here we are, 3.6. So this is basically just a breakdown um, of our major fixed costs and you can see the county retirement figure um, and the dollar change as well as the percent change and health insurance and the other category is made up of all the other fixed costs um, under employee benefits so that would be workers comp that would be opeb that would be uh, medicare that would be uninsured medical unemployment that's just employee benefits um, and you can see that the employee benefits budget is increasing 5.6 percent over fy18 the other fixed cost category that's listed there is um, the regional school assessment, um, reserve for abatements and exemptions, snow and ice, um, and debt service. Those are some of those, and the general liability insurance. Those are the other fixed costs. And then we come down to our total fixed costs, which includes um, the other fixed costs as well as employee benefits. And you can see that overall it's a 3.3 percent increase here is a snapshot of our available revenue um, compared to fy18 and it also is a snapshot of the town's level services um, submitted budget as well as the the schools 
And you can see on the bottom the school's budget gap as of today or as of the financial planning meeting that we had on uh, February 15th and the town's budget gap as the town as the town administrator submitted his budget requests. Mr. Masseri. And those, both those gaps are based on a calculated level services. No. no. So, no, they are not. Um, no. The, the estimated level services for general government budget is level services um, plus a few things. Um, I wouldn't say that it's modified level services because this is the town administrator's recommended budget request. The departmental budget request for the town side was a lot larger. Um, so this is slightly modified level services, I would say, but it's not fully modified level services. Um, and the, the school's figure is um, modified level services. Okay, I'm not looking in the same place. I'm just looking at the revenue plan that was put into the... Uh, so down at the bottom of that revenue plan? Right, down at the bottom. It says, uh, it says Towns 2019 Budget Level Services, 16039563 And then there's a, a second line. It says Budget Modified Services was 17503438 Yes. And the Towns Available Revenue leaving a, a, a variance of uh, 587,000 plus. Yes, That's based okay, so on the level services number. That was my point. Is so the town's um, number that's listed up here is the town administrator's recommended budget, okay. which is not a fully modified level services budget. The okay. departmental request of the um, 17 million and change is the modified level services. But it's that top line minus available revenue that comes up with a $587,783 yes. shortfall. Yes, and that is listed on this slide on the bottom line. Yeah. The town budget gap is the 587. We're comparing the available revenue um, to the town administrator's recommended budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what you see as the number change mm -hmm. where you see that it's 816,000, that is year over year. So that's taking FY18's approved budget over um, FY19's town administrator recommended submitted budget. So that's what that column represents and the budget gap on the bottom is based upon uh, the town administrator's recommended budget. Okay. Any other questions? So we don't usually talk about current cash reserves uh, this early on in the budget process, but the town administrator and myself thought that this would be uh, useful so that everybody can see our financial position as we stand today. So this lists um, some of our current cash reserves that are typically used um, as the other financing source on the revenue plan. Free cash, um, typically we evaluate free cash and we pay for one-time items from free cash or we will transfer free cash into the debt capital stabilization funds. Um, to offset the debt service budget. The stabilization fund, um, we typically do not touch to offset the, the operating budget. And as I just mentioned, the capital stabilization fund, um, that does get used to offset the debt service budget annually. The water infrastructure stabilization fund typically um, will pay for smaller um, <coughs> capital items within, you know, for the water department. And when I say smaller, you know, items that only have a five-year bonding term, um, we, we typically will pay from the Water Infrastructure Stabilization Fund. The Solid Waste Stabilization Fund um, is typically used to offset the uh, sanitation budget, the solid waste budget. And um, the funds that are available in this fund come from any remaining operating budget um, funds at the end of a fiscal year in the sanitation budget. Water retained earnings. Um, typically the water retained earnings are transferred into the water infrastructure stabilization fund in order to pay for smaller uh, term capital items. And the cell tower fund is, is another financing source that offsets um, the operating budget annually. 
Mrs. Manupelli would like to ask a question. I just have a, you have a great way of explaining in layman's terms what these financial terms are, but can you, for the viewing public, explain debt service? You, you've mentioned sure. it a few times. Yes. Debt service um, is what we pay for principal and interest on items that we have borrowed for. So capital items, um, you know, if we're buying a d dump truck for DPW or a fire truck that was approved at last town meeting, um, you know, the fire truck cost $575,000 the town pays for that over time. So it has a certain length of time that we can borrow for. And we, you know, typically for an item that large, it would be 20 years or 15 years, depending upon um, the industry life on a vehicle like that. A dump truck is uh, typically 10 to 15 years as well, but sometimes you can um, extend the life on those. So it is money that we're borrowing to pay for these large capital items um, that we pay principal and interest on, and that becomes our debt service. Similar to a mortgage payment, we're, we're, we're borrowing the funds to pay for those items. Thank you. So some of the next steps um, that we need to take for the FY19 budget process. As I mentioned earlier, um, one of our uh, steps that we're taking with the health insurance budget is um, meeting with the IAC on a regular basis um, and working with them to finalize the health insurance budget for FY19 as well as meeting with you all to you know review the status of where we stand and what you know what we may need to do to um, tackle the FY19 health insurance budget. We will also continue the procurement of the solid waste collection contract, um, which we have, we're carrying an increase in the operating budget for FY19. Um, we are evaluating the use of available funds to address the budget shortfalls. So that basically what I mean by that is um, evaluating the current slide, seeing what we can attribute to um, the other financing sources on the revenue plan, if we can increase those by, by any of those um, available revenue sources. And we are going to begin on Saturday conducting our budget hearings um, and reviewing the departmental requests and prioritizing their requests along with the town administrator's recommended um, budget request. Mr. Goldberg. Through you, Mr. Chairman, just a couple of clarifications um, to the finance director. On the last slide relative to cash reserves, that avail available free cash of just over a million dollars, I believe we're carrying using $500,000 of that number in the revenue plan that was in the package. So the balance after including the revenue plan would be f about $558,000. Yes. And then secondly, just a note relative to the solid waste contract. <coughs> There was some initial information that I think we reviewed with the board back at a December meeting with a former DPW director relative to a projected increase in somewhere in the vicinity of 25%. And I think we carried that in the budget rec in my budget recommendation um, as a potential increase of 100 and just under $170,000. But after having an initial conversation with the provider uh, due to the continued deterioration in the market, I think that we can expect that it will exceed that dollar amount in terms of the increase. So the Acting Public Works Director, uh, Mr. Clark, and I um, will be working on a um, procurement document that will go out and shop around um, probably early next week relative to a successor contract. I also think that based on the timelines that we're looking at and the cost at this point, while we will certainly be closely entertaining the uh, opportunity for the automated collection in at least one of the two areas that we do collection, it's more likely to see that being implemented in fiscal year 2020 rather than fiscal year 2019 because of the cost. And that's just new information that's come in over the past 48 hours that I just want to make the board aware of. We'll talk about it further at a future meeting. Um, not sure that we'll have much more useful information for Saturday's budget hearing, but I know that it will come up uh, later in the process. Do you project that there's going to be a difference in cost to the ratepayers even next year? With regard to solid waste, I, I think undoubtedly we're going to see a change in the uh, an increase in the solid waste disposal fee 
um, based on where the market is at. You know, again, that fee is intended to cover the cost not only of collection but of disposal. And the biggest issue that we're facing is that uh, recycling, which at one point in time had a value towards our cost, is now basically being treated as trash and being disposed of at the cost of trash, $70 a ton or, or more. It's not just our community. It's no. communities all around us. That's correct. And we, you know, I think to our credit, took advantage based on the DPW director's recommendation of uh, locking in some pricing with Covanta before this really got out of control. Um, and that was back in September. So that, that is, I think, one step that we are, we've been ahead of the market. Well, I think it's a perfect example. When was the last time we had a rate increase to the rate payers? Uh, I think you're looking at least six years. Is that right? More? Six or seven years, mm -hmm. I think, if I remember correctly. Which, you know, no one wants a rate increase. I don't think anybody in this board was hoping we'd have to do that. But I think we've worked pretty hard to stabilize it for six or seven years. So unfortunately, I think it's time to... We've run that course, I think, as far as we could. Uh, unfortunate in this situation with the recycling isn't getting any better. And I, I have to say, out of everything you presented today, and I've done this now several years, and the one that really has me the most very nervous is this solid waste issue and what, what the future brings for us. So I think we have to get very creative, and I think we're going to need the, the community support, too, mm -hmm. in supporting whatever path we, chose, we choose that uh, if we, we get the community buy-in. Because this isn't getting any cheaper, and it's not going to get any easier. <laughs> Questions, board members? I, I know I know you went through this in relatively quick time, but I know there's a tremendous amount of hours put into this, you and your entire team, and, and the town administrator as well. So thank you, and I look forward to the meetings on starting getting things kicked off on Saturday. Uh, the fun begins. So, uh, but if there's no other questions, we'll uh, let you get home and. We'll continue on with our agenda. Thank you. We'll see you on Saturday. Mm -hmm. okay, rest up. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll go ahead. Okay. Next on the agenda is the town administrator's report. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, through you, two items to report for this evening's meeting. The first is that I am pleased to report that the town's Youth Substance Abuse Grant Coal Coalition has uh, successfully completed the National Coalition Academy. Coalition was recognized at a ceremony in National Harbor, Maryland on February 6th. Copies of the certificates in the program are attached, and I want to thank Amy Luckowitz for her work representing the town, stewarding the, um, the coalition's participation in this event um, earlier this month. I'm also pleased to report that North Reading will receive reimbursement for expenses that the town incurred during the 2016 election cycle uh, in which early voting was offered. And I, I want to thank Representative Brad Jones for his advocacy on behalf of the town, assisting us in, 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 in identifying and obtaining every dollar that's available to the town from the state. Um, I know he filed uh, an amendment early in the legislative process and advocated for it to be included in a successor, a successor bill and then ultimately advocated for the release of the funding. And I just want to extend our gratitude and recognition to Representative Jones and to Senator Tarr for their efforts. And that concludes my report. Mr. Messieri. Just a, a question regarding Chapter 90. Have we got any, I know the governor has proposed a $20 million yes. bond. We get any info on that? Yes, through you, Mr. Chairman. I believe yes. there's a letter in correspondence this evening, but the number, if I recall offhand, is $512,000, which is largely consistent with what we've seen the past three fiscal years. Okay, so there's no change. And it, as you know, there's a pending $300,000 uh, request in the capital improvement plan for uh, town road repairs, which would supplement that for a total of just over $800,000. Any questions? Any, anything else? No, no, okay. We'll go into old and new business. We'll start out with Mr. O'Leary. Well, I, I'm sure, Mr. Chairman, that uh, I know we got a little rushed this evening. And I'm sure you were going to comment on the uh, tra tragedy of last week. And, uh, you know, generally, you know, we talk about having a moment of silence and things of that. Uh, and again, from the time I've been sitting in this board, we've had a lot of different uh, tragedies take place in this country and the state and this nation, and we take a moment of silence. And, you know, th this is uh, 
This is not a moment of silence that we should be having here. Uh, this is a moment for, uh, should be for, we should be raising our voices and speaking loudly and clearly. This is a moment to uh, voice our support uh, for the survivors and their families who are speaking out. This should be a moment uh, to applaud the sane and sensible voice of those surviving students at uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Uh, who are the true leaders in this particular, at this particular time. And they're leaders who are being ignored and deflected by their elected leaders. I mean, what's happened down in Florida where they uh, haven't been able to meet with their elected officials uh, is very sad. Again, it's a sad state of affairs when our children have a clearer, clearer vision, voice, and understanding of what we're facing. Hopefully, uh, they have a stronger voice and uh, for sure, uh, they're not going away, which is fantastic, you know, and, and unfortunately it takes tragic events like these to get these kids to rise up, but they're not going away. Our House, Senate, and Executive Branch down in Washington won't uh, confront or deal with the issues of gun control. Um, we'll have no universal or expanded background checks, no federal assault weapons ban, no raising of minimum age to purchase or carry a gun to 21, yet these uh, children can buy, purchase, carry a gun at 18, but can't buy or have a beer with their piece of pizza. Something wrong. Uh, what we will get, probably to look at, is some legislation that, uh, to blame it on mental illness, it's gonna require local schools to do better screening, reporting, educating, counseling, again, passing the costs onto the local communities. We're going to see legislation that's going to probably require local schools to provide secure, a more secure environment. Uh, here in our own community, with the new school that we built, we have spent tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars on additional security already to protect our, our youth in our school systems, and who knows if that's enough, but those costs, again, uh, are going to be passed off to you know, local communities. We're going to have proposals to uh, arm our teachers and quote, to quote a governor, uh, arm those willing to be armed with additional stipends and add guns to our schools. Local communities uh, should add armed police to every school and metal detectors. We've already been doing some of this in some of the communities around here. I, I guess, you know, it's a more of a reality check. And again, we talk back to Sandy Hook, we talk back to Columbine, we talk back to all these other events that have taken place over the last uh, several uh, decades and lack of action. It's important to put it into perspective here. The Second Amendment was conceived and drafted when families and militia, local, state, and federal government had muskets and gunpowder, ramrods and lead balls for weapons. You know, the government had uh, maybe a few extra cannons that the citizens didn't, but that's when it was conceived, when it was drawn upon. And, and times have changed, certainly. Uh, right now, our citizenry is better armed than our public safety officers, even here in North Reading. A sad state of affairs, something we need to be talking about and looking at. Our country progressed from horseback, horse and buggy, to stagecoaches, to trains, planes, and automobiles, and soon driverless cars and already drones. The laws, rules, and regulations for owning, operating, proficiency, proficiency testing, documentation of transfer and suitability of ownership and operation have changed with, with the times, but not with guns and gun ownership. And we have to call upon our federal leaders to do something along with our state. Things should and must change. Finally, uh, to our own backyard here a little bit, you know, I have a wonderful, strong, loving, and lasting relationship of over 40 years with my wife, Sue. And if you ask her, uh, I don't get a 100% rating, uh, voting rating or rating with her, because we don't agree on everything. You know, but we do come to some reasonable, uh, yeah, well, anyway, I don't have a 100% voting record with her anyway. Uh, with her. Yet, you know, we have legislators close to home here in Massachusetts with 100% ratings from the Gun Owners Action League of Massachusetts or the NRA. S something's wrong with that. Even in the best of relationships, there will be disagreement, and it's not happening. Uh, 
um, people need to get more realistic about how we're going to deal with these things and come up with the, come, come up to date with reasonable laws to assist in controlling this. You know, so to my colleagues, you know, feel free to join in. You know, my moment of silence, you know, shouldn't be a token gesture. It should be a sincere and uh, followed with, with action and loud voices. And, you know, you know, I've prayed for these victims and the survivors, along with everybody else in this community across the nation. And moments of silence are, are, are wonderful and a fine gesture, but they shouldn't be meaningless and they shouldn't be shallow. And uh, I think we, we need to start speaking out here at the local level so it resonates through the state and up to the national level. Again, here in Massachusetts, we are far more progressive uh, than a lot of the states in the nation, but it has to catch all. This is, this is out of control and something needs to be done. So I thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak. That's all, Mr. Chairman. And I do apologize. I did have planned in a, a moment of silence in the beginning where we had eaten up so much time that we had some people that had to rush to another meeting. I'm sorry I lost, but we could certainly, uh, we could certainly take the moment now to uh, just reflect on what's happened and what's continuing to happen throughout this country. We'll take a moment of silence. Thank you. You know, I appreciate the words, Steve, that you're saying, and uh, you know, we don't always agree either. But in this particular case, I'm in agreement with you. I think there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, it should have been done before this administration we have now. It should have been done before the administration that was there before them, and so on. But we can't continue to do nothing. And I think, finally, for the first time, I can say, I think everyone's realizing doing nothing is not an option. Um, but I will say this. I'm proud of Massachusetts. I think we've set the bar for gun control and the things that need to be done, and we have a lot more work we can do. I am a gun license owner. I was trained with the military. I work with the military. I've gone through a lot of things. I've seen a lot of things. I've been all around the world many times, and it doesn't need to be the way it is. So I think it does take leadership at all levels, at local level, all the way to the federal level and uh, we, we are we have to have many voices on this one and the time is right to make common sense change to protect our children but I will get around to it. I don't want to circumvent my other board members but I do want to say this we are working to try to have a forum in town we, Michael Gilberto and I have met with the superintendent and we, we believe there needs a, there is a need now to have a parent, parent forum to make sure we inform the people in our town that we have a lot of good things in place. We've done a lot of good things and we can make improvements because we don't want people to have fears. We want them to be able to send their children off to our schools and feel comfortable and I think it's time now we get everyone in a room and explain that to them. But we're not gonna explain everything, okay? Because there's certain things, again, I've been trained in the military, worked in the industry for many years. It's okay when you don't have to know everything. There's a reason for it. And our schools are set up with certain uh, protocols and structures that we don't need to tell the public about because we don't need to create more vulnerability than we already have in some cases so uh, but we are working I'm not guaranteed we're going to be able to do it but we're working we have our town councils working together to try to find out what we can say when we can do this so I know if we can do this I would really I would request that the board members all try to participate in it. Mr. Misery. It was a very very sad event and I'm in agreement uh, with Mr. O'Leary's comments about something has to be done. That something is broader than just taking all the guns away. I mean, if we look at this particular incident, there were communication breakdowns. Uh, there were a lot of things that could have prevented it even before it happened. And. Uh, you know, I think we have to look at the entire picture and come up with a solution and perhaps what the kids of that school have started may lead to that. Maybe, maybe they'll get to the legislature and get them to think about a whole bunch of things. Uh, but there's a lot more than just the individual that did the shooting at fault here because 
uh, there was a clear breakdown in communications, it might have prevented the issue. Uh, we can talk about this all night, and I don't really want to. Uh, I'll close on this and say it was a sad event. We all should be concerned and hope that we come up with solutions that will prevent this kind of thing to happen in the future. Uh, Michael and I, and I'll leave the real content to you, Michael, I went to the DEP with the town administrator, and Mark Clark, and our consultants associated with sewer. Uh, we talked about the both paths that we're on, the fact that we have to make a decision soon. Uh, I didn't, correct me if I'm wrong, I didn't hear anything from the DEP regarding uh, any issues that we might have going in either direction. That's correct. They're very supportive of what we want to do, and they, uh, they understand it's important to us and the future of the town, and they want to work with us. Uh, this isn't the DEP of old. This is a, a DEP of a lot of reasonable people working in there. They understand how important infrastructure is to the lifelines of all these communities. So. Um, we're very fortunate to have representatives that are very right down the street that are willing to work with us and it was a good meeting and it was a quick meeting because we you know right now the most important thing is they've told us is come back and see us after you figure out what you're doing with your water so we gotta just keep on uh, grinding away on that and get that decision in place and then kind of everything else will fall in place whether we separate this and pull out the wastewater at some point We'll have to address that in a few weeks, but uh, Michael, if you wanted to add anything else. No, I, I think that that's a, you both have succinctly described the meeting. Um, you know, they, they seem to really feel that there were alternatives available to us um, with regard to wastewater. I mean, that was the focus of our discussion, both to our north and to our south. And then from a permitting standpoint, it didn't seem that there was uh, more or less restriction in terms of the permitting um, one way or the other based on their feedback so and we know they were great to set up the meeting on fairly short order I think we were with um, we, were, we were in another meeting 10 days ago 10, day, 10 days prior so they, they set up the meeting and met with us pretty quickly they gave us you know the, the attention of two staff persons in the Wilmington office so um, you know we certainly appreciate that anything else mr. miss Harry last thing is uh, just a little the public know that we are meeting with the Andover Board of Selectmen here on Wednesday night. Meeting is at 7.30, correct? Yes, sir. that's correct. Will it be televised? It will be. Good question, because I was going to ask what I'm going to do. <laughs> well, you're and coming to I'm going to talk a little bit more about that okay. meeting when uh, it comes. Mr. Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I try to keep things local and nonpartisan up here the best I can, but there are sometimes you have actions that you have to kind of speak out on and what happened in Florida obviously is just horrendous to say the least while you cannot rationalize the actions of a crazy person um, you know I think most people want reasonable gun control I just wish our folks our representatives you know from our congressman to our president to our senators would get together in a bipartisan manner and get something done I think putting stuff on Twitter whether it be our president or whether it be our congressman is just inappropriate it's not going to get something done they need to work together I think reasonable people want this. To the, and to the parents, the number of parents, vast number of parents that have reached out to me over safety issues in our schools that have called me personally over the last two weeks, you're, you know, what you've said to me is very heartfelt. Um, I have nothing but the utmost confidence, and I think our whole board does here, of our public safety officials in this town that are going to do the right thing. They're going to make sure everything is safe. And I just want everyone to be reassured that our town is doing everything we can within our realm to make sure our kids are safe and I just wish people in DC could stop the crap and get something done I think everybody wants a reasonable gun control measure and I, I just find the, I've never seen it so divided in Washington right now I just wish people would come to the middle and kind of reach some common ground because there is common ground out there to be had thank you mr. chair this is menu Pelly and I, I would I would just echo the similar comments I and I agree wholeheartedly with selectman O'Leary here and I I just want to add just a few more things it's to be a little bit cautious about stigmatizing mental illness because there are 
thousands of people with mental illness, diagnosed mental illness, that go get the help that they need that aren't, you know, interested in committing these sort of heinous acts. So to just be cautious about stigmatizing. There's no one answer here except, as Selectman O'Leary points out, people that are intent on committing these evil acts aren't doing it with a gunpowder musket. They are getting an assault rifle very easily and more than one, they're getting arsenals of weapons. So one thing is a fact here that's undoubtedly clear, and that is what's being used to commit these, these types of completely insidious acts. And I think what our schools are doing right, and I think what our kids are doing right, which we saw today with the Northeast Vocational School and which we saw with uh, the high school recently is they are stepping up, they are reporting things, they are seeing things on the social media, they are saying, they're reporting things. If you see something, say something. So somehow, and unfortunately in the time that we live in, that message is getting across and, and these kids are speaking up, which I for one am very grateful for and I'm, I'm grateful to the school administrators for what they are trying to do to tackle this and to suggest that you know, we, number one, arm our teachers who are already serving in multiple capacities for our kids. And, and to have them be burdened with uh, having to stop a scenario, they were already armed resource officers at these facilities and we have, we have our own resource officer there. So if this could have been stopped or should have or would have, arming the teachers when they already, it's a, it's a lack of, it's a total lack of understanding. Probably, have you ever set foot in, in a public school? Probably not. Have you ever sat down and talked with one of, the, one of our public school teachers to understand the multiple roles that they play and then to add on that they're gonna be armed and get a bonus from what source of funds are we gonna give bonuses from? It's now, I'm sorry for my diatribe, but <laughs> let's get real with some real solutions here. And it's not just one answer, check for mental illness or, you know, be in this. It's multiple, multiple solutions here. If you, I also think, and again, this is a personal opinion, I also think people my age are out of touch with what this generation of kids are, are going through, good and bad. And I agree with Select Manolia. These, these students, student leaders that we're seeing come out of this uh, tremendous tragedy, traumatized by what's happened, they are the change. And, and I applaud them and I welcome this. And I also welcome that from our own kids. We have great leaders in our own student body here. Um, so I just think that we're also out of touch. So as a parent and two other parents, we might sit back and say, we know our kid, we know what our kids would and wouldn't do. Um, but some parents are in a haze and I think you should get out of the haze and talk to your kid. Some kids fall through the cracks and there are multiple flags that go off. That there are multiple reasons why we all need to stop and pay attention to the flags and that scenario and what scenarios are happening in our own communities are the other reason why. Stop, <coughs> get out of the haze, pay attention to your kids, talk to your kids. I think there's a, there's a great divide right now that, that we need to bridge to in terms of our younger, our younger kids. And I'm not an old person, but if I sit and try to get into the minds, mindset of what's going on, there are, some, there are some kids there that feel like there's nothing else beyond this. Once I'm out of high school, that's it. It's not something that I can relate to. I don't know if my colleagues can relate to that. I, we always felt like the world was our oyster and there was so much we could do when we, when we got out of school and anything that we set our mind to do, we could do. I don't know that a lot of people of that generation feel that way. So I don't know, again, where the answer is, but I do think a lot of it has to do with communicating. The flags get raised, pay attention to the flags, 
get out of the haze and pay attention to your kids. And that's some of the steps that we can, we can do. Um, but I, I agree wholeheartedly that, you know, these are the kids that they say out of the mouths of babes, they're, listen, listen to them. They have solutions that they know can be effective. Why we're not stopping and making that happen is, is baffling. So we need to be a part of ushering that change in too, I agree. Thank you for listening. So you, may, you heard me mention earlier about this parent forum, and I still believe it's important. And I think now is the time for us as leaders to get together with our parents because times have changed. We're living in a different world than we were two weeks ago. We knew we were, but I don't think it was as real as we have seen it now. And I think it's important because we've done a lot of good things. And I think that's where you start as leaders. We get people in a room and we express and make sure they have the comfort of going home to their kids and explaining that we have done a lot of good things in this time. We've invested a lot of money in safety, and we'll start there. Are we perfect? No, but on Friday, on Saturday, we're having a budget hearing, and I think if when you go and you read these budgets that have been put forward to us by all our public safety um, leaders, there's uh, investments that we need to continue to make and I think we should be willing to share that with the public as we go through this process and to get their feedback. Because you know sometimes um, just listening to is a good answer. And, and it's sort of what you say, not only listen to the kids, but we need to listen to our parents. We need to give them a forum to talk, talk to us because as you can see, they don't come here well because we have a lot of things on our agenda. But in this one, we need to have one agenda item and we need to talk about the safety in our, not only in our schools, but in all our municipal buildings and and we got to start there so I'm hoping we can still pull this off and I'm working pretty hard and Michael and I have been continuing to work with the superintendent to make this happen uh, so we do have changes in our budgets that reflect to this um, I want to go back to this again you start listening what's going on around the country people are using Massachusetts gun laws because we have some of the most strict in the country as the baseline where they want to get people and I think that's great. And I feel good about saying that. And, uh, and I know we have more work we can do. In regards to the hearing about the water meeting we're having on Wednesday evening, in our past few meetings, I think you've heard us talk about Andover Town uh, Meeting. They had a special town meeting where they made a modification to the Warren article that somewhat changed the agreement that we had in principle with Andover. And we're just trying to figure out a way forward. And Andover is supposed to be coming here on Wednesday evening to explain to us what they can do to sort of, if there is a way to rectify the modification that was made to their warrant article at their special town meeting. And, and that's what we're supposed to be doing, is listening on Wednesday evening. Public is welcome to come. And then we're gonna be making a decision at our meeting on Monday, May, March 5th, depending on what we learn on Wednesday. So uh, if anybody has any questions or need more information prior to that, you can always reach out to me. My March 14th, everyone has their schedule for the Secretary Ash's visit, and that'll be here in this room. And uh, Michael and I have worked on an agenda, and I will get that out once we finalize. We built a little script on how things will go. We'll share that with the board members so everyone can prepare. Let me just see if there's anything else I had on my list. Um, National Night Off, March 13th. You know, National Night Off, we've been doing now for about three years, I believe, uh, I think this since you arrived. Year. Fourth year, yeah. Fourth year. And I think it's a great evening for folks to, no meetings, uh, to take an opportunity to go out to dinner with your family and, uh, and just spend time as a family and, and take a night off. And I love that we're participating in it again. Well, I just want to reiterate what Mr. Schultz had brought up early. I've had a lot of people in the community reach out to me in regards to Ipswich River Park. Ipswich River Park is a jewel. It's a jewel of our town. It's a centerpiece of our town. I couldn't be more proud of it because that's where I started my political career is working in the Park and Rec group. Uh, we have six acres of land there. We put a lot of money into it and allow people to go down. People go down there and take advantage of it. We as a community need to stand up together and, and stop it and ask people to please leash the dogs, clean up the feces that their dogs are leaving behind.
because it ruins the park and we don't want to have to turn around and have our police officers spending time when we you've heard about this you know just the drug issues that are going on in town the security issues that people have to have people turn away and go down there and cite a, give citations out for leashes is ridiculous so hope it's going to get in the paper i hope people are listening come on community we're better than this we don't need to be spending our time on this, this is common sense it's respect the laws their bylaws are there for all of us and if we could just all work together we can spend our time our valuable time on things that really help move this town forward and uh, that's all i have mr Masseri. just a, a question we, we're meeting saturday for the budget yes sir on monday we have a board meeting scheduled correct? that's correct are we going to continue with the budgets i want to know if i need to go those and yes, which? there yep. are bu there, there are budget hearings four, scheduled. That evening. Three or four on Monday the yes. fifth. Mm -hmm. There's four that we have. I don't know the top of them off the top of my yeah. head. Yeah, we'll get the schedule out to the board members. So we'll it's, in the, it's it's yeah. actually in Dropbox. Oh, it is. I want to have okay. a chance Good. to go through them before the meeting. Sure. Thank you. No, no problem. So I will see everyone in a couple nights uh, from now. And uh, I'd like to make motion a motion to adjourn. adjourn. And a motion to adjourn. A second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.